Liber Monstrorum The Book of Monsters The Liber Monstrorum, a late 7th or early 8th century, Anglo-Latin catalogue of marvellous creatures, uses an ostensible discourse from an author to his superior about the believability of monsters. In order to contain anxiety about England's contemporary social and ecclesiastical situation, the author generally discounts the work of pagan poets or philosophers unless confirmed by Christian sources. Since the Liber Monstrorum author cannot always verify the status of the monsters depicted, he leaves the decision about their existence to the reader. The possibility of disagreement among readers problematizes the perception of a broad, dismissive ecclesiastical view of marvels. However, that the Liber Monstrorum permits individual opinions on the subject of monsters does not imply an assertion of freedom from authority, but rather that the author allows freedom within an authoritatively defined discourse. The narrator's discourse with a presumable social superior subtly suggests that if the marvelous narrative from which the description of the monster is derived is not a miraculous sign from an infallible God, it must be seen as part of a fallible dialogue between humans, and any possible error must be contained by an appropriate interpretative authority. The Liber Monstrorum Here begins the Book of Monsters of Various Kinds. Prologue you have asked about the secret arrangement of the lands of the earth, and if as many kinds of monsters are to be credited, as are demonstrated in the hidden parts of the world, raised throughout the deserts and the islands of the ocean, and in the recesses of the farthest mountains. And, you were particularly asking me, to answer about these three kinds of the world's area which strike the greatest terror of fear in humankind so that I should record the monstrous parts of men, and the horrible and innumerable forms of wild beasts, and the most dreadful kinds of dragons and serpents and vipers. And whilst discussion of these things, once shone almost everywhere for humankind, as if with the brightness of a lofty star, through the authority of many writings, I should have thought that those lies were unrepeatable to anyone, if the gust of your request had not cast me from the high poop, quivering amongst the monsters of the deep. For I compare this task with the dark sea, since there is no clear way of testing whether that rumor, which has spread throughout the world with the gilded speech of marvelous report, is true or steeped in lies, of which things the writings of the poets and philosophers, which always foster lies, expound the greatest part. Only some things in the marvels themselves are believed to be true, and there are countless things which, if anyone could take winged flight to explore, they would prove that, although they should be concocted in speech and rumor, where now there is said to lie a golden city and gem-strewn shores, one would see their rocks and a stony city, if at all. And first, I will discuss those things which are in some part to be trusted and then let each judge for himself the following material, because throughout these monster-filled caverns, I shall paint a little picture of a sea girl or siren, which if it has a head of reason, is followed by all kinds of shaggy and scaly tales. For first, the discussion takes its beginning with those things which differ by a rather trifling amount from humankind paying heed to the individuals that the earth, the mother of mortals, spawns, or is said once to have spawned. Because now, when humankind has multiplied, and the lands of the earth have been filled, fewer monsters are produced under the stars. And we read that in most of the corners of the world they have been utterly eradicated and overthrown by them. And now, cast out from the shores, they are thrown down to the waves, and that by the churning from the steep summit of the pole, they turn from the edge of the entire circle, and from every place on earth towards this vast abyss of the flood. End of Prologue Book 1 Indeed I bear witness, at the beginning of the work, that I have known a person of both sexes, who although they appeared more masculine than feminine, from their face and chest, and were thought male by those who did not know, yet loved feminine occupations. 
and deceived the ignorant amongst men, in the manner of a whore. But this is said to have happened often amongst the human race. And there are monsters of an amazing size, like King Hyjlak, who ruled the Geats and was killed by the Franks, whom no horse could carry from the age of twelve. His bones are preserved on an island in the river Rhine, where it breaks into the ocean, and they are shown as a wonder to travelers from afar. Or like Colossus, who in his huge bulk, like that of sea monsters, outgrew all men. When he was wounded, the stream of the Tiber could not cover him, into which he had flung himself at the point of death, failing from his wounds. From him right out to the mouth of the Mediterranean, some eighteen miles. The water is said to have been mixed with so much blood that the whole river seemed to flow from his wounds. Afterwards, the Romans erected a statue of the greatest size. This work has been heard of throughout almost the entire world, which stands 107 feet tall and surpasses nearly everything in the city of Rome by its marvelous reputation. And we read that there were certain extremely bellicose men of huge bodily size, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Yet they were sound of mind and differed from other people only in the addition of four digits. Moreover, fauns, who are called thus from their speaking, are wood dwellers and have human appearance from the head to the navel, although their heads disguise curved horns in their noses and the lower part of the two feet and the thighs is represented in the form of goats. The poet Lucan sang that according to the opinion of the Greeks, they along with countless other kinds of wild animals were drawn to the lyre of Orpheus by his song. Sirens are sea girls who deceive sailors with the outstanding beauty of their appearance and the sweetness of their song and are most like human beings from the head to the navel with the body of a maiden, but have scaly fishes' tails, with which they always lurk in the sea. Hippocentaurs have the mingled nature of horses and humans, with heads shaggy, like wild animals, but in another respect, most like the human norm with which they can begin to speak. But their lips are unaccustomed to human speech, and they cannot form any sound into words. And we have heard of a person born in Asia from human parents, with a monstrous mixture. He was like his father in the feet and stomach, but had two chests, and four hands and two heads. And widespread rumor drew many people to marvel at him. There are Ethiopians who are black in their whole body, whom the flaming sun continually burns with excessive heat, because they dwell under the third, most seething and torrid circle of the world's zones, and are protected by the recesses of the land from the vapor of the most burning stars. And likewise, on the other hand, we read of a certain race of humans near the Rypean Mountains, protected from the snowy cold by the land in winter, where the snows under the chill great bear of the north fall to a depth of seven ells. As centaurs seem to have the reasonable bodies of humans, down to the navel, and the lower part is represented by the shaggy foulness of wild asses. In this way, the diverse nature of different species naturally combines them. And there was a certain human race in Sicily, where the flame of Mount Etna is read about. They have a single eye as broad as a shield under the roughest of foreheads and they are called cyclops, and used to exceed the height of the tallest of trees and feed on human blood. And one of these is said in books to have lain in his cave holding two men in one hand and to have eaten them raw. Who does not admire the courage and weaponry of Hercules, who at the western entrance to the Mediterranean erected pillars of an amazing size as a spectacle for the human race? and who constructed trophies of his wars in the east by the Indian Ocean, as a memorial for posterity, and afterwards traveled in battles through almost the entire world, 
and spattered the earth with so much blood, and at the point of death wrapped himself in flames to be consumed. And we have heard tell of a certain girl, not yet with swelling breasts, discovered on the western shores of Europe, whom the waves of the sea brought to land from the ocean. They marked her size with stones. Indeed fifty feet was the length of her body, and she was seven feet wide between the shoulders. She had come dressed in a purple cloak, bound with saplings, and fatally wounded in the head. It is reckoned that Scylla has been the monster most hostile to sailors in that channel which washes between Italy and Sicily, having indeed the head and chest of a maiden, like the sirens, but the belly of a wolf, and the tails of dolphins. And what distinguishes the nature of sirens from Scylla? is that they deceive seamen by their deadly song, whilst she, with the strength of her force, girt about with sea dogs, is said to have mangled the wrecks of the unfortunate. And in India, next to the ocean, we have learned of a certain race of humans, hairy in their whole body, who are said to live on water and raw fish, covered in natural nakedness only by bristles like wild animals. And the Indians call them ichthyophagi, or fish eaters. And they are not only accustomed to the land, but dwell in streams and ponds, and mostly next to the river Epigmarus. Cynocephali are also said to be born in India, who have the heads of dogs and spoil every word they say with mingled barks, and do not imitate humans, but the beasts themselves, in eating raw flesh. And they say there is a race of people whom the Greeks call cyapods, or shade feet, because lying on their backs, they protect themselves from the heat of the sun by the shade of their feet. Indeed, they are of a very swift nature. They have only one leg each for their feet, and their knees harden in an inflexible joint. There are people in the east, dwelling in the vast solitude of a certain desert who, so they say, have beards reaching right to their knees, and live on raw fish and by drinking water. And amongst these incredible things, there is described a certain race of joint sex, who have a right male breast for performing work and a left female breast for nourishing babies. And people say, they reproduce by alternating sexual roles. Also, certain people from near the Nile and Brixanus rivers are described as having bodies of amazing whiteness, twelve feet tall with a split face, long nose, and skinny body. And there are people whom Greek tales say have no mouth like the rest of the human race and eat no food but are reckoned to live only by the breath of their noses. Women, so they say, are born near the mountain of Armenia, covered with hair, having long beards down to their breasts, who, since they are huntresses, rear tigers and leopards, and swift kinds of wild animals instead of dogs. And it is said that a certain hostile or unseen race of people are born in caves in the hollow recesses of mountains who are a cubit in height. And it is reckoned join war against cranes at harvest time in case they snatch their crops. And the Greeks call them pygmies, from the Greek word for cubit. There are also men on an island in the river Brixontis, who are born without heads, whom the Greeks call epifugi. And they are eight feet tall and have all the functions of the head in their chests, except they are said to have eyes in their shoulders. And in a reliable narrative, we find that a certain person had crescent-shaped feet, with no more than two toes, and that their hands also are described as being formed after the measure of this pattern. In the east also, next to the ocean, we read of a beautiful race of people, and they claim that the cause of their pleasantness is that they eat raw meat and the purest of honey. And there is another race of people, who are said to have the briefest of spans, to mark their life. 
their women conceive at five years old, and they do not live beyond their eighth year. There are, so they say, beautiful women living near the Red Sea, whose bodies shine with the brightness of marble, who are twelve feet tall and have hair flowing down to their ankles, cow tails on their flanks, and the feet of camels. And they say, that there is a race differing from human nature in the following way. They have complete bodies, but the functions of the head seem at odds to the turn back feet. And their footprints deceive those who do not know this. Also in a certain desert, fiery mountains are read about, in which people are born black in their whole body like Ethiopians, of whom we saw a certain one, as black as coal, but with shining teeth and eyes and nails. There was a certain monster in Arcadia called Cacus, in a cave by the river Tiber, spewing flames from his chest and hairy all over, who stole four bull and the same number of cows from their herdsmen, and through force of strength dragged them backwards by their tails to his cave, so that they would not be discovered. And they say that there has been another monster in a certain spot near the ocean, who saw, from the shore, a boat slipping on the waves, and the sailors, terrified by the sight of him, hesitating to come to shore. And he snatched the ship and its crew from the midst of the sea, and placed it on dry land. Also a race of people with huge bodies is born in the east of the river Brixantis, black in body and who reach eighteen feet in height. And so they say, when they catch folk, they eat them raw. And they say there are monsters in swamps, with three human heads. And they are alleged to live like nymphs under the deepest pools. It is a profanity to believe this, since floods do not flow there, where a huge monster enters. Proteus also, with his azure body, is said to have been carried naked through the sea in a chariot of two-legged horses, and to have had dominion over every kind of fish, and is described as being able to turn himself into the shapes of all things. And there is said to be an island in the eastern parts of the lands of the world in which people are born reasonable in stature, except that their eyes shine like lanterns. There was once a person of marvelous nature, whom they called Midas, who, as the tales allege, turned everything which he touched into gold. And no one believes this unless scorning the truth. Three Gorgons are also described with the monstrous nature of women, Stheno, Uriel, and Medusa, who are said to have lived on the borders of Libya, next to Mount Atlas who used to turn men to stone by their sight. Perseus slew one of them protected by a glassy shield, and she is said, when her head was cut off, to have moved her eyes as though alive. Argus is described as having had numerous eyes to see, and they say that nothing could be concealed from him completely, because it is imagined. He was always on the lookout, with some eyes. There is a certain race of mixed nature on an island in the Red Sea who are said to be able to speak the languages of all nations. In this way, they astonish people who come from afar by naming their acquaintances in order to deceive them and eat them raw. Innumerable monsters are also said in books to have been on the borders of the Circean land. Lions and bears, boars also, and wolves who, whilst the rest of their body kept the nature of wild beasts, had human faces. And they say, what is impious to be said? That, there is a certain monster of the night, which always used to fly by night through the shade of the sky and the earth, terrifying people in cities with its dreadful cry. And it had as many eyes and ears and mouths as it had feathers. And it is always said, to have been without rest or sleep. People are born in the regions of the East, 
who as the fables imagine, reach fifteen feet in height, and have bodies of marble whiteness, and ears like fans with which they cover and conceal themselves at night. And when they see a human, they flee through the vastest deserts with ears outstretched. It is read that there have been certain monsters, harpies, on the islands of Strophades, in the Ionian Sea, in the form of birds, but with the faces of maidens. And they could speak in human language, and were always insatiable with gnawing hunger, and with their hooked feet, they snatched food from the hands of those eating. A false tale also describes certain women, the Eumenides, who had viperous hair tied back with bloody headbands in which azure snakes were thrashing in mad anger. And their iron bedchambers are imagined in incredible fables to be in the underworld. Likewise, satyrs and incubi are called woodland folk, of which the top part is very like the human body, and the lower part is depicted with the forms of wild animals and fawns. And a certain monster in the underworld is written of, that is Tidios, whom they have called Earth's nursling. And his body extends stretched out there for nine Iudra. Aegean also is said to have been another monster, with the most massive bulk and of incredible shape. And he had fifty heads and one hundred hands, and from every single mouth he used to vomit fire and spew forth crackling flames, and as instruments of war. He carried fifty shields, and the same number of swords. The fables of the Greeks say that there have been people with huge bodies and of such bulk. Similar, however, to humankind, except that they had dragon tails, whence they were also called in Greek, dracontopodes. But I shall depict the Minotaur that deformed monster in the same fabulous Greek stories, who had the head of a bull, and, when enclosed in the labyrinth, is said to have groaned with both cries and bellowing, because he could not escape the house in Crete, which had a maze, surrounded by a thousand walls. It is read that the instruments of war of Eryx also exceed all human measure. He was not a monster, however, but a human of monstrous size. And seven ox hides sewn with iron and lead used to cover his shield. And they said that Triton was like a human in his head, a semi-wild thing in his chest, and like fish down below the navel. And he is described as having been seen in the Carpathian Sea of the Egyptians, and around the shores of Italy and it is not known whether he had his name bestowed from the swamp Triton in Libya, or the swamp from him. They also say that there is a race of humans under the globe, which are called antipodes, and according to the interpretation of that Greek name, they tread the lowest foundation of the globe, with feet directed straight up to our footprints. Indeed, giants used to grow to such an enormous size that it is said that all the sea were passable to them on foot. And their bones are often found, according to books, on the shores and in the recesses of the world as a mark of their vast size. They also write that the twin Aloidae were of such immense bodily size that they tried three times to destroy the sky with their hands because of a burning desire to rule, so that they could hurl down Jupiter from high Olympus. But Orion is imagined to have been such, that he could cross all seas and overtop with his shoulders the waves of even the deepest flood. And thus, he dragged mountain ashes and huge oaks, torn up by their roots from the mountains. They say he crossed the peaks of mountains and knocked the high clouds of the sky with his head. Epilogue These are the huge monsters concerning which the wave of your request buffeted me, and those are the ones which I have gathered to these shores from the foaming torrents of fables. 
but there are still innumerable things which they have said have existed both on land and in the sea, concerning which it is tedious to wish to write more, even that which they say in highly disgraceful fables about hellish people, such as Chiron, Niobe, Daedalus, Triptolemus, Atlas, Coeus, Iapetus, Typhoeus, and certain others. Here ends the book of monsters. This is a 31 Pearls production. Thank you for listening.